Everyone on the coach knew about Coldies, the top-rating television series, a feature film, and a myriad of books had seen to that. But very few had been around when Colditz Castle was providing dramatic material for the media. In the early 40s, when it was the German home for hundreds of Allied prisoners of war with the infuriating habit of trying to escape. Only one man on the bus really knew about that. Captain Kenneth Lockwood spent only a little time actually fighting the Germans. He was captured in the retreat to Dunkirk. He tried to escape. For his pains, he became one of the first British officers to be sent to Colditz Castle. It was to be his home for the next four and a half years. Now, 50 years on, he's come back. A year ago, Kenneth Lockwood's personal pilgrimage would have been impossible. Colditz lay in the forbidden land of Honecker's East Germany. But now, with the dividing border gone, a bewildered Colditz has caught the attention of the travel agents of the West. This is only the first coachload of eager tourists. There'll be many more to come. But as Kenneth Lockwood is about to find out, becoming a tourist trap may be the only way Colditz can escape even more hardship and economic disaster. But the locals, numbed by 40 years of neglect and isolation, were not quite prepared for their first encounter with curious visitors from the West. They were, they later admitted, startled and staggered on meeting some of them, members of the Queen's own Highlanders, fully armed with pipes and drums, and who, like all Scots, never missed a chance to show off their talents. To visitors from the west, Colditz is the castle, the thousand-year-old fortress dominating the town. For most of them, it's a curiosity to be satisfied. For a sprightly Ken Lockwood, now almost 80, it's a time for active remembrance. A proper guardhouse with a, a sergeant and what have you down here, the bottom part. And they came out of there dressed as German officers. They were saluted there. They were saluted at the next gap down there, went on through the next arch, left into through that wicked <coughs> gate away. And they got away, both of them. Oh, yes. But that, that, that of course, yeah, I mean, go out of the front door. It's the proper way to do it. <laughs> uh, now this, now we come into what was, this was our, our quarters where, where, where we lived. Now, there's a, a little hatch thing down here. Uh, Bush Parker had the idea that at some stage, uh, that getting in there, there might be a, a way out to a drain hole or something like that. So he, he got out of one of the windows, came down and got in there, but it was a, it was a dead end. No luck. No luck. Now, th this was, uh, virtually speaking, all that we had, except the odd occasions when we were allowed to go down the park. We'll go down there later. But this was the only exercise space we had uh, for however long you were here. It was just like this, cobblestone. Sadly, the castle, like much of the rest of Colditz, is a victim of monumental and disgraceful neglect. For more than 40 years, it's been left to rot and decay. Restoration would cost millions. From these barred windows, Ken Lockwood and his fellow British prisoners contemplated escape. From them now gazed the present prisoners of Colditz, scores of mental patients. But the communist bureaucracy that controlled the hospital unit has now gone. What will happen to it and the patients, no one knows. No one will even hazard a guess. Fifty years ago, at Colditz, there was no such uncertainty. There was no other way about it. You just had to cope. 
course, we were lucky. One mustn't forget that uh, uh, the conditions in, uh, we, that we had here, if you compare them with the conditions that the, uh, the prisoners of war of, of Japan, well, I mean, this was, this was easy compared with what they got. Uh, and I, I've always been of the opinion that a tremendous amount of fuss is made uh, uh, of this. Of course, cold has become a myth. And uh, really, you see, if you've taken a, a prisoner, it is your duty uh, uh, to, uh, first of all, to evade uh, before you get deep into your captor's country. And if you can't do that when you get into such a place as this, uh, to escape and to be as much nuisance as possible to your captors, so as to occupy uh, some of their uh, soldiery. Were, were you a nuisance to them? Well, that's, uh, yes, we were. <laughs> no argument about that. The communist regime commandeered part of the castle to house its growing army of elderly. But that did nothing to stem the flow of neglect. Not a new tile, not a coat of paint for more than 40 years. Inaction that's taken its toll. Admittedly, some parts of the castle are still intact. The memorial theatre is still there. On its boards, allied prisoners stage their concerts. Entertainment that bemused the German guards, but created a vital smokescreen under which many prisoners escaped. I was interested to come back because, you see, I, on uh, luck of the draw, I had never uh, got outside the camp. Uh, the only times I'd been outside were down to the park or, or uh, the, the once when there was a big search and we were carted off down to the Schutzen house. But otherwise, I'd never been outside at all. And I wanted to see the outside of the place and also to see what, it, what had happened to it. Like most German towns, Kolitz has a museum. It's not very big. A year ago, that didn't matter. Visitors totaled only a handful a week. But coping with a flood of visitors from the West has created its own problem. Uh, now, uh, a lot of uh, visitors we have, uh, sometimes too much. Uh, but uh, it's not to handle. Uh, sometimes there come uh, three coaches with 100 150 people, and so uh, these rooms are too small, but we hope in next time we can change with this room, with the museum showing the escape histories uh, to one of the cellar rooms in the castle, and then it will be under the rear roof, it will be a better place. Hanging from the walls are reminders of the castle's grisly past as a fortress prison, where torture was a daily routine. There are relics too of its more recent past, the homemade regalia and security passes that allowed dozens of allied prisoners to fool their captors and to escape over its walls. There too is a photographic reminder of a bizarre wartime deal struck between the Allies and the Germans. After top secret negotiations, the Germans agreed to floodlight the castle by night to prevent its being bombed by accident. The small museum staff admit the real problem facing Kolditz is not its past, but the daunting changes that lie ahead. There's no doubt, Kolitz could become a big tourist attraction. But in reality, that's a dream role many years away. True, it already has some of the ingredients for success. It has the castle, the jewel in the Kolitz crown. And there, there's a bonus. Archaeologists excavating the foundations of its medieval chapel have found even more. The tunnel dug and used by French prisoners in a bid to escape. The wartime legless hero Douglas Bader broke a chapel window playing cricket in the castle courtyard. It's still waiting to be repaired. The arrest cells used to house recaptured escapees are still there embalmed in thyme and cobwebs. The flaking whitewash bearing the scribbled names of those who hadn't got away. But unless action's taken soon, 
the innocent historic graffiti will have vanished forever. Kolditz does have a railway station, a little run down, but linking the town with the rest of Europe. But there's little else to satisfy even the most undemanding tourists. There are no hotels, there are no gift shops, there are no restaurants, only a small cafe. Another handicap to developing a tourist industry is a question of identity. Kolitz may be famous in Britain, Holland and France, but nowhere else. Certainly not in Western Germany, its main market for tourist traffic. To people west of the old border, it's just another rundown community that will cost them dearly to put right. Kolitz is in a time war. Everywhere there's the sight and sound of the 50s with the depressing, grey, post-war austerity we once knew in Britain. There's been little or no development for four decades. If the roof collapsed, the house was abandoned. Planning permission, money and building materials were not to be had. The whole place, said one visitor with candour, is in desperate need of a lick of paint. But even that would cost a small fortune, money that Kolitz doesn't have and isn't likely to get. The local industries face a major crisis. They'll survive only at a very high price. With an open market has come a new ogre for Kolitz, the spectre of unemployment. Under the old communist regime, the famous Kolitz brewery had no trouble selling its entire production. Local drinkers had no choice. Total lack of investment and modern machinery didn't matter. But those heady days have gone. Beers from the West are now readily available and highly popular. No one, it seems, now wants to drink the local brew. The workforce has already been cut by a half. The decrepit brewery remains a nightmare for any environmental health officer. The brewery is worn out and falling apart. Well, over the past 40 years, we've had a so-called planned economy. Every factory was answerable to a higher authority. We were told what to do by people sitting in offices in Leipzig. The result was practically no investment in the brewery. So we couldn't carry out the necessary modernization and expansion that would have allowed us to produce beer of the same quality as other countries. Only when we have a good, high-quality product can we face the new economic system. Otherwise, we'll have no chance of survival. Also in trouble is the biggest employer in Kolitz, the porcelain factory. Under communist rule, like the brewery, it too had little or no competition. Half its export production was easily sold in the soft markets of the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc. The rest was snapped up by the West and Scandinavia. Reunification produced a dramatic trauma. Production has been cut by a half. The order book is almost empty. Former customers in the East now demand products from the West. Those in the West fear economic instability will damage business confidence. They're buying elsewhere. The factory has little modern machinery, but an astonishing 1,100 workers. Job losses are inevitable. Management, until now spared the fierce heat of commercial competition, now face horrendous problems. We are not used to thinking in terms of a market economy and will only be able to solve the problems once we've adjusted our way of thinking. But the people of Kolditz are prepared to learn quickly. The way we ran the company in the past has no place in a market economy. We can have only as many workers as we need to function economically. In Kolditz, we will need 300 fewer workers, but those that remain can be sure of their jobs. An optimistic view, but one not shared by economists in the West. They claim survival of the factory will demand the loss of another three to four hundred jobs. A high price to join an open market. Those who go will find it almost impossible to get other work. Inevitably, the people of Kolditz are looking with almost childlike anticipation for a new economy. Top of the list is tourism an enterprise centred on the castle. 
But in the hands of the inexperienced, tourism can be a two-edged sword. Development could spoil the remarkable atmosphere and charm that makes the place so attractive in the first place. The pioneering tour organisers insist that won't happen at Kolditz. I think there's a certain family spirit over here which is not in West Germany and it will certainly take perhaps a generation before, before this change will infiltrate through. After all, people have been captive here since 1945, let's say. Kolditz today is full of rumours. There's speculation that a major development company from the West is waiting to pounce on the town and change its unique lifestyle forever. And that includes the castle. Look, the, the, the castle belongs to the, these Germans. Uh, they can do as they please with it. It's not ours. We were here, what, four years and five months of its life. Uh, it's, got a, it's got quite a history, this place. I mean, in, in England, we, we have um, people with uh, stately homes and they open, open to the public. Well, if the East Germans want to do that with this place, why shouldn't they? It, it's not ours. The skirl of the pipes has long faded from the town of Kolditz. So too has the euphoria that enveloped the town on reunification day. Now the small Saxon town must face the harsh realities of a Western-style market economy. In the square, under the castle, there are more shops, and the windows do now have merchandise in them. But the price tags are high and local wage levels are far below that enjoyed by workers in the West. But there's a far bigger problem for the people of Kolditz. The spectre of unemployment is no longer just a possibility. It's now a reality. 25%, a quarter of its workforce, is now without a job and with little prospect of getting another in the near future. The local brick company once produced building materials for the whole of Eastern Europe. Now it's closed, no longer economically viable. Its workers have joined the local dole queue. And that's the fate of three quarters of those who worked at the Kolditz porcelain factory, the biggest employer in the town. The pessimistic forecast of 1990 sadly proved to be accurate. 300 job losses were not enough. A total of 800 redundancies were needed for the company to survive. Again, the collapse of the Eastern European market provided more big headaches for the new management. Our biggest problem was getting into an entirely new market. We just had to get a foothold in Western Europe, as well as expanding into the whole of Germany. We've changed and modernized our designs and concentrated on the hotel market. We're busy installing a lot of new technology. In a bold gamble, the plant was temporarily closed down while that new technology and machinery was installed. New ovens and drying machines. New labour-saving processes. And more vital still, new modern designs of product aimed at the fastidious buyers of the West. And with all that comes a slight touch of optimism. But the porcelain factory is taking no chances. They've let a large part of the plant to a Western supermarket chain. The rent, they say, comes in very handy. The future of Kolditz Castle is far from certain. 
the whole building has been taken over by the hospital management. Much of it is now out of bounds to visitors. To get inside at all needs special permission. The famous castle clock tower is undergoing emergency repairs, we were told, to stop it falling down. The wartime punishment block with its unique graffiti is even more derelict. It's now cordoned off, considered a danger to the patients and the public. The rest of the castle remains as it was on the eve of reunification, in desperate need of massive and urgent restoration. Even Douglas Bardo's window remains unrepaired. Rumours abound. The latest is that all the patients are to be moved to a new hospital some miles away, and that an English consortium has made a bid for the castle, with plans to turn it into a tourist hotel. That rumour, like many others at Colditz, remains unconfirmed. In the town square there are a few changes. The town hall has been renovated, given a much needed coat of paint and a new clock. And the local garage and filling station, taken over by a French company, has been given a facelift. But the cobbled road surface hasn't been touched. It still provides a challenge to the suspension of the very few old East German Trabants still around. In Colditz, the Trabbies are an endangered species. On reunification, they were quickly replaced by the obvious new status symbol, a car from the West. But with those cars have come other less welcome imports from the West. The car park is no longer free, and there's a machine to prove it. and the streets are becoming littered with parking restrictions. Despite all the exciting plans for expansion, the museum hasn't changed. But the curator has. Made redundant, he now drives the local ambulance and remains a realist. These problems uh, are normal for this time, for this heavy time, and it's not so uh, easy to change it between two or three years. This uh, country was very down, and now it has to develop slowly. It's impossible to make it quickly. The one bright economic spot in Colditz centers on its ancient brewery. 400 years old, in March of this year, it was about to go into liquidation. No one wanted to drink its brew. Management and workers were within days of joining that dole queue. Then we struck lucky. We were bought up by a West German businessman and he's put all his energy and a lot of money into redeveloping the old brewery. Everywhere there's work going on, it's like a building site here. In every department there are changes and modernization. And when it's all finished, our customers will be getting a higher quality beer that smells good, looks good and tastes good. The fairy godmother who saved the Colditz brewery lives many miles away, at Munchengladbach, near the Dutch border. Klaus Lowenthal has more than one reason for buying the brewery. I worked in the brewing industry when I was younger, and the fascination to work in that field again was irresistible. Klaus Lernthal is investing millions of Deutschmarks on redeveloping his brewery and building a new hotel nearby. But however successful, they will employ only a handful of local workers. Salvaging and bolstering the local economy is a monumental task faced by the new Western-style politicians. Promises were made on reunification, which have not yet been kept, and people here are not very happy. We are pushing ourselves really hard to return Colditz to what it once was, a small Saxon town in which the people had something to live for and had jobs.
but I don't think we'll have achieved real unification for at least 10 to 15 years. These are very uncertain times for what used to be East Germany. There have been some changes and clearly many more changes yet to come. But the expectations of reunification are obviously many years away from completion. There's still a great deal of work still to be done. For Kolditz, there's no escape from that.